Hey, welcome back to Play and Trade Guitars. I'm John, that's Zach behind the camera, and this is Play and Trade Guitars, where we play it and trade it. I'm about to show you an incredible tour of the Martin Guitar Factory. This is a nearly 200 year old family owned business that is the American guitar story. This tour is led by Ramin of Martin Guitar Company and we're gonna give you a step-by-step -step process of how it's built. And whether you play guitar or not, it's incredible to watch the skilled men and women who build these guitars. It's an artistic, blending of machinery and manpower that goes into each one of these instruments. It's an incredible story, you'll see it here. At the top, we are giving away a Martin D28 when we hit 100,000 subscribers. To win that guitar, it's simple. Hit subscribe now, turn on notifications, and use our entry link. Sign up via Gleam, all of that's in the description. And also, when you're in the market for any new gear, click to buy new gear using our link. You support our channel directly, it helps us make these videos when you buy gear using our link, and you get a whole bunch of benefits too, so check that out in the description. Without further ado, I am so excited to walk through the doors at the Martin Guitar Factory now. Join us and let's check out how these American guitars are built. Incredible, let's do it. Killer, well, we're glad to have you guys here and let's get into it. Thanks so much, yeah. let's do it. All right. <laughs> it's a great feeling walking through these doors. So you're going to notice a lot of cool sights and smells in here. It smells um, incredible. Yeah, the smells of, of some of these woods are like uh, otherworldly. We're going to start with a real big picture view. Sure. And uh, to aid in that, we have a big picture <laughs> guitar here. So uh, Christian Martin I um, was alive during an era when most instruments were using strings that were made from animal um, materials. So mm -hmm. we call them gut strings. Right when the metallurgy got to the point where people could actually stretch pieces of metal into wire, you know, and th there was a need for wire for other reasons as well as electricity is developing, the sure. telegraph. Well, what you end up with is people putting uh, steel or nickel alloy strings onto instruments that were not built to accommodate that kind of tension. Mm -hmm. And this is all in an effort to make the guitars louder so they could compete in that environment before amplifiers, right? Sure. But what the X-Brace does, uh, we have an interlocking joint right here, um, which is placed pretty strategically in that all this torque is pulling on the, the body of the guitar, yeah. the strings are going through, the top is pulling like this. And so to reinforce against the collapse or the deflection that could happen in front of the bridge, you have this really strong point. And it turns out that that lends itself to a pretty specific guitar tone, which I think what we consider today is the quintessential American flat top guitar. Yeah. So uh, let's take a look at some guitars actually being braced. So um, this doesn't look like anything from the outside, but if you look closely, you'll see that what we have here is a guitar top inside a bladder, right? So there's a, a latex or I don't know, some sort of rubber bladder, sure. um, uh, which you can see sticking out here. And what we've done is we've taken the top, we've placed it down on, the, on a heated plate. We take our braces, uh, we roll them on a glue wheel. Uh, back in the day, of course, you'd use your precision glue applicator and you'd smear some glue on there and then you put it, on, uh, put it in place. And when you close the lid to this bracing deck, all that um, rubber is going to suck down uh, at an even consistent rate mm -hmm. and apply even pressure downward. And we actually heat them uh, from below so that the glue cure uh, is accelerated slightly. And what you end up with is a pretty slick system for, uh, for vacuum um, bracing guitar tops. Uh, you see the, the space here, we got one, two, three, four, uh, four bracing presses on this side of the, of the wall, the aisle. Well, if you look back there, um, you can see that just recently they developed a new system so we can have six bracing dishes in a, um, in a, a rotating, basically uh, a stacked up situation where you know hydraulically you can lift it up so it's ergonomic to work on it, right? Yeah. And by the time you close the press uh, and you get ready to work on the next one, you can pull it out and there's a guitar that's ready to pull, uh, you know, ready to pull out. And I can see that the, I can see the rubber kind of just sucked down over the bracing. And right? you can and see it's, it's released out. out, exactly. Yeah. So if you want to build one or 10 of something, um, you can do that uh, by hand. You can do it with minimal tooling. You can do it at home. But if you want to build 
a hundred or a yeah. thousand of something with a degree of precision, yeah. a consistency and great results, you need tooling and fixturing. So big shout out to the tooling guys. That's uh, awesome. They make this place, uh, they make this place run. So coincidentally, uh, there's another example of some technology here. This is a bridge plate um, that has been skinned with carbon fiber. Oh, so that, that's the modern deluxe. Series. Yeah, it's uh, it's torrified maple in the in the middle, but um, carbon fiber um, on the top and back. It's carbon. Modern deluxe. Look at that. That's that's modern. Extremely right <laughs> lightweight. I mean, it's uh, it's really cool. Very very cool. strong, um, stable stuff. All Did right. you hear that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sounds like music. <laughs> so uh, once the braces are actually glued on the top. Um, they have to be uh, treated with some care because if you leave them if you leave them long the way that they've gone on uh, not only are they are they long right and that's mm -hmm. so that we can use uh, in some cases the same brace on a variety of different body shapes so like let's say uh, there's an application where maybe the angle is a little different but we have a grant j body or something that requires more uh, more length we can use the same brace um, and then in the end, it's going to be chiseled down to its final dimensions. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what we're doing right here. If you guys oh, wow. can, can, can we spy on you for a moment? Oh, thanks, man. Much appreciated. Wow. So these, these craftsmen and women are uh, extremely skilled. It takes, uh, it takes some time to develop the level of um, hand skill and confidence. Um, I can't even imagine, yeah. And a very sharp tool. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of viewers out there, if you're not a woodworker, you might be thinking that, uh, you know, a sharp tool is more dangerous than a dull tool. And in some ways that's true, but from a, from a working standpoint, it's actually much safer to work with a sharp tool than a dull one. Um, and that's for, for a variety of reasons. You want something that's gonna cut cleanly, that's not gonna catch, you know, on a wild grain, if there's a, some yeah, sort of grain sure. deviation. Um, something that's going to cut consistently and be able to take these braces and feather them down so that they're so thin at the tips that um, some braces like cross braces we tend to we tuck them into the ribbon lining of the guitar but these ones we actually have a crush fit mm -hmm. so uh, it has to be down it's like it's so thin you can see right through it wow. Um, he and makes it looks so easy and yeah. I'm not going to kid myself about how hard that a lot of, A lot of skill and let me tell you, a lot of time sharpening tools too. Wow. But you can see here pretty clearly how uh, delicate the work is to, to peak these braces. Mm -hmm. So from a, you know, a physics standpoint, what we're doing is we're maintaining a certain level of height, but by removing the excess material, uh, we're able to keep the strength, but w reduce the mass, okay. right? So a pyramid, you know, uh, like a dome, very, very strong shape. Um, Sitka spruce has been used for a long time uh, in aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, it's something, I, when I mention this on tours, people are like, huh? But there was a plane uh, called the Spruce Goose. Oh. It was like a kind of famous, uh, famous plane back in the day. And all throughout, um, not, you know, not just the early days of aviation, but even through World War II and beyond, a lot of aircraft were made um, with, with Adirondack and Sitka spruce. And that led to the depletion of our red spruce forests around here. Wow. So those are coming back now, uh, which is really, really good. Uh, so generally the spruces that we use are Sitka, mm -hmm. um, but we do use Addy. Um, here you can see a variety of species. We have uh, maple used for the bridge plate. Okay. Uh, we have a very cool Martin logo, which is that. lasered in backward. Oh. So that when you look in through the guitar with a, through the sound hole with a mirror, right? If you're doing oh. an inspection, oh. then it will appear um, the front ways. Would never think of that. Right? Yeah. It's it's the little things, right? Right. Are there any particular woods that have become a challenge to obtain? Oh yeah, you know, on a, from a geopolitical standpoint, um, you know, anything that you see in the news happening on any given day. Uh, that's going to impact supply chains for anything else yeah. is going to apply to wood even more so. Okay. Uh, and that's, you know, that has to do with the fact that it's a, it's a natural resource. Mm -hmm. And um, rightfully, uh, many uh, countries and communities are protective of their natural resources. Sure. So, uh, for example, um, if we uh, have a contract in place and we have a source for, let's say, Guatemalan rosewood or something, and there's like civil unrest in Guatemala, um, that might disrupt the, the supply chain, right? And then we'd say, okay, well, 
we have a strategic inventory of woods. Do we spec a change to an alternative wood? Yeah. Um, and th these are conversations that happen all the time in real time because there's a lot of stuff going on. If the world I mean, revolved Martin's around- I've been doing it for a little while, so I, I'm sure you have good relationships. <laughs> if the world revolved around guitar making, I think it would be a better world. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't. Right. This is pretty cool. What we have here oh, is yeah, a, a the, laser profile. Cut, huh? Absolutely, this is a laser profiling table. And if you, if you can catch this while well, it's actually oh, working. Yeah, look at that. Um, so what we've done is we've taken our panel, we know exactly what body uh, that's gonna be going on and what it's gonna look like. Yeah. And now the laser is swinging around. Wow. Oh, look at that. A little bit of flame too, little, I like it. Little flame spud, yeah, it's cool. That is really cool. And uh, what you end up with is an extremely accurate yeah. um, outer profile of the instrument extremely accurate location Smoking. of the sound it. hole and those ears. Yeah. But in order to get that wood on that table, yeah. we have to first determine what kind of guitar do we want it to be? Okay. How do we want to orient the piece of wood? Sure. And uh, this is another one of my favorite um, tour stops. This is a really cool station. So uh, what we do with each piece of wood and, and truly every single piece of wood is getting hand I inspected. Sometimes we'll twist them to make sure that they're stable. We're looking with a fine tooth comb. We're matching backs and sides together. And even that is not quite enough to satisfy the needs of, uh, of our production. Um, so what we do is we backlight each piece of wood uh, so that you wow, can that. see what's going on internally. And so we have some sort of thing here, something up here. So those are knots in the wood, is that? Yeah, or, that or is, they could or? be sap pockets, okay. uh, or they could just be dark grains, you know. Yeah. Whatever they are, they're probably fine, but once you start sanding on that piece of wood, what happens if they come to the surface, mm -hmm. right? What if they're just hidden under there? Well, that would be kind of unsightly, uh, could be stru structurally um, compromising. And so what we do is we have um, uh, markout templates for every single shape and size and righty and lefty um, of every guitar that we make so that we can say, all right, our center line, we know where that is, can't negotiate on that, but we can negotiate wow. vertically on the mm -hmm. position of where we want to cut stuff out. So if we go here, then our imperfection here is covered by the bridge. Our imperfection here is cut out by the sound Makes hole. Sense. Or what if it's covered by the pick guard? That would be fine too, right? right? And so um, once we, we say, okay, this is the location we want, we'll put a mark right there, and then that will be the indexing line that our laser operators will use to put it in the right spot on gotcha. the laser table. Makes so sense. over here, you can see, here's, uh, here's Mary. She's got our backlight table here so she can look through pieces of wood, and she is inspecting and sorting uh, pieces of wood by a, a few different criteria, grain closeness, color, any kind of like racing stripe going up and down, those will all impact how a piece of wood is graded. And then um, really spectacular things like what we call bear claw. You ever seen bear claw spruce? It's not really from bear claws, but it's uh, it's sort of a cross grain, like a shimmery, oh, okay. um, a shimmery kind of striation okay. that appears. And it's really, really cool. Oh. Now uh, over here, you can see uh, a rosette being installed. So we have a, a variety of rosettes that we use. Um, some of them are using uh, fiber materials or, or maple. So like, here's a really skinny piece of maple. Oh, yeah. um, and you can see just how flexible and fragile that is. And then sometimes we'll use um, plastics as well. Here, we'll, we'll make way. Uh, sometimes we'll use plastics as well. This is a material called Bolteron, which we've been using for a very, very long time. It's a type of plastic. Um, and we, uh, we have, a tool, more or less, the right tool for everything. So let's say you got your rosette channel, you would use a glue uh, gun like this, which is slightly warmed um, specialty adhesive uh, with a precision tip so you can get it exactly where it needs to go. Yeah, see that. So you'll notice quite a lot of like weird looking tools and it's because there's the right tool for the job. Uh, here's some mahogany tops being cut out. That's so cool. I gotta watch one more of these. Absolutely. Wow. And there's that horizontal index line you talked about. 
that was it a pencil line basically yep. where yep. then they'll line that up and you can see it's lined up with that arrow on the back side of the yeah of the sort of the wall of the table there mm -hmm. yeah, there's the arrow and uh and that's how we know that we're in the right spot Mmm, cool. cool. fresh wood yeah so over here is our custom shop Oh. And it looks like uh, you guys are in luck. We'll all pull over uh, over to this side here. How's it going, Kyle? Everything good? Nice. So here in our custom shop, um, aha, uh, we are crafting instruments more or less the same way that they were built uh, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, in some cases, that's part of our authentic line. Yeah. Um, now the custom shop is also a place where we could, you know, we can build you anything with whatever you want. If you want that really special instrument that's got, you know, your grandmother's maiden name inlaid and mother of uh, mother of pearl or yeah, whatever on yeah. the board, no problem. Right. Uh, all the way up to highly exotic materials and uh, and configurations of things that are maybe non-standard. Um, for example, we don't make a whole lot of. Nylon strings in production. We do. We have. We have one nylon string yeah. model. But if you wanted an N20 or an N10 or something really old school, Willie Nelson style yeah. guitar, that would probably be made here in the custom shop. Um, but uh, uh, my uh, my friend Chris here is preparing the back of a, uh, a D18. It looks like to go uh, onto this rim. And um, so you can see he's sanded the rim. He's installed his ribbon lining, yeah. and he's built this whole guitar using hot hide glue. So hide glue, different from fish glue, but hide glue is also an animal product. It has to be kept wet in a glue pot oh, wow. like this. Um, it is kind of challenging to work with because it has a pretty short open time, right? You don't have a lot of opportunity to like align and realign your stuff. It's got to be perfect from the get-go. Your joinery has to be perfect, the surface contact. Um, it dries like totally crystalline, like really, really hard. And uh, just while, while he's doing it, what, uh, what Chris is doing right now, he has a very small router, almost like a dental tool. Yeah. And he's using this template to create pockets in the ribbon lining of the, of the guitar so that when he puts the back on, that the, the braces will tuck oh. into the ribbon lining of the back of the instrument. Oh. And that's for a couple reasons. It means that uh, they won't, they're less likely to come loose. Uh, and it also means that um, you have a really nice visual uh, effect on the inside of the instrument. So all that dust, you might think, well, who cleans all the dust off their desk, you know, multiple times a day. But the reality is if you were to leave those pieces there and then lay down a flat piece of wood, oh. it could dent, uh, it could dent a top or it yeah. could dent a back. So yeah. all the dust's got to go. I wonder if we can ask for a visual demo once uh, once he gets that all squared up. In the meantime, here is a, a little demo bucket of glues. Oh. So this is dried hide glue. Oh yeah, it's like a. I mean, it's like a. a it's a rock. Crystal rock or something. This is dried fish glue, oh, aka yeah. animal protein glue in the in the marketing lit. Um, this is melamine glue. Do they smell like anything? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. They smell bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Animal, animal something or other. It's an acquired taste. Oh, I'm sorry, we got uh, traffic. Uh, and yeah, then don't eat it, I don't recommend This it. is a, a type on, like a PVA type uh, okay, type okay. glue. All right, um, you know, and hide glue has been used for thousands of years. Yeah. Oh, the other thing about hide glue, you gotta heat it up. So that's a heat lamp that's actually going to prepare the surfaces by applying a little bit of, uh, little bit of warmth to them. Okay. And uh, so, Chris is going in there. Wow. So it's not only traditional, but uh, some folks believe, and there's been a, a fair amount of uh, both scientific writing and uh, pure opinion writing on this topic, um, which, uh, you know, which is around whether hide glue by its nature of how it dries so crystalline, it doesn't fill gaps, you know, does it result in a better sounding instrument? Hmm. And I think that um, to my ear, the answer is yes, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, if you have uh, a hide glue 
uh, applied properly, that means that your joinery was perfect, which means that probably you're going to end up with a, a better built guitar, which yeah. should sound better, right? right. Theoretically. Um, but if it's not used correctly, no amount of hide glue is going to help a, help a guitar sound good if it was built sloppily or without attention to detail sure. that would be required to get a good hide glue joint sure. in the first place. Yeah. So chicken or the egg, I don't know. Um, no chickens are used in the making of hide glue. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll just stick around long enough to see if we can watch Chris uh, pop it back oh, on I'd this thing to, yeah. and get it in the bracing press. So uh, once that uh, frame and, uh, and guitar are in place and the, the, the board with the rubberized uh, sort of cushion is in place, um, Chris is going to hold everything right where it needs to stay until that bladder on the upper side of the uh, of the bracing press has inflated. Okay. And the bladder will apply quite substantial downward pressure on the whole thing. So you're basically making a guitar sandwich. Oh, okay, you got your yeah. your top is one bread, your back is the other bread, and then your your guitar is in the middle. Um, the bladder is interesting because obviously you apply that amount of pressure, but you're not putting like a hard tool surface on. You're using basically air. Exactly. Like a, like a pillow or exactly. A yeah. uh, and those bladders, you know, they last like a really long time. Yeah. Uh, you can see it's it's had some patches over the years, but it looks pretty good. Yeah. And it allows us to spin and inspect the guitar rather than using like a rigid bracing frame, okay. so that we can do some early glue cleanup. Yeah. But more importantly, make sure that we have squeeze out all the way around. You want squeeze out, you know, that means you've got enough glue okay, yeah. uh, and that the, the joints aren't starved, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, what we have here is our, uh, our, our custom shop inlay station. We have a little robot back there to cut pieces of pearl, oh, cut yeah. pockets. But in the end, each individual piece needs wow. to be um, hand, you know, fitted in the end, uh, installed. In this case, these wood pieces, these are all individual pieces of wood. Wow. And so to get that fit. oh it's oh unreal goodness. this one was rejected uh, <laughs> so to get that shading on these pieces of wood uh we have a really cool technique that was rediscovered here in the custom shop it's called sand shading okay. and you basically take a hot plate full of sand and you dip the wood in it and wait until it starts to char and then you pull it out obviously before it like burns really oh, okay. bad and that's how you end up with this three-dimensional shading on each individual piece Tattoo of shading. wood wow. unreal right my goodness Yep, uh, a variety of things we've done over the years. What have we got? Hashtag save elephants there you go. with synthetic ivory, of course. Looks right. really good. And uh, oh, here's a good example of some crazy bird's eye, you know, oh, yeah. crazy bird's eye maple. You know, it looks fabulous. But the bordering around these pieces of reconstituted stone is unbelievable. Like that tiny little pearl border. I can't even I mean, imagine how you get to do something. I mean, even these skinny little lines, I don't know how you... Uh, yeah, well, you, you use like ma like a magnifying loop glasses yeah. kind of thing. It is wild. Here you can see um, a bridge going on, a custom shop guitar that looks like an aged authentic model. Uh, so, you know, in the guitar world, there have been a lot of uh, companies that have made efforts toward aging uh, electric guitars, uh, sort of the, the relic thing. Um, you know, my, my personal feelings on it is that if, if any kind of uh, aesthetic changes uh, to an instrument uh, are going to make the player want to pick it up and play it, it's a good point. It's good. And vintage Martin guitars are so expensive that we felt like it would be a great way to put that vibe, right, that inspiring feeling of a vintage Martin yeah. into the hands of someone for, you know, one tenth of the cost. So they're still expensive guitars. They're made with the right materials. They're built with the right construction methods. Yeah. Um, and then aged tastefully, artfully, but they still have a lifetime warranty. So uh, what you're looking at back here uh, is an array of side bending fixtures. Okay. And what we do with those is we'll take a, a straight flat piece of wood that has been profiled on the laser uh, so that the, the base side is thicker, or rather the, the lower bout is thicker and the, the upper bout is thinner. And we take that piece of wood, we uh, either spray it with water or we soak it in water, or we soak it in a combination of water and other substances, depending on what the wood is and how prone it is to cracking. Okay. And then uh, we will put it flat into one of these uh, presses. So 
We still bend stuff by hand if necessary. We have um, bending irons. I still can bend wood by hand. Uh, the skill set is alive and well. However, for, for our production purposes, we need something that's more consistent. Yeah. It's a sort of a best fit line um, for a lot of different body shapes or woods or styles of yeah, instruments. So uh, steam is generated by the heat from the presses, uh, hitting the water that's inside the wood or on the surface of the wood. And then that causes the fibers, the lignin to relax. Mm -hmm. And then you can sort of like wrestle it into a new shape. And uh, you know, wood bending is used in uh, not just guitar manufacture, but piano manufacture. It's how they make those, uh, you know, sort of the backside of a, a grand piano that's sure. all bent. Um, barrels, old hoop barrels, uh, staves would be bent like that. And even um, from for like spruces, even old skis, like Scandinavian oh, okay. skis, yeah. um, those are bent with uh, with steam as well. Um, pretty darn cool. Yeah. Pretty old school. So it's heating, works. it's heating the moisture content in the wood itself. It's not adding additional moisture. Well, we add it beforehand by spritzing oh, the wood spritzing down or it. soaking okay. it. That makes sense. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, our woods are dr quite dry. Um, you know, uh, for stability's sake, sure, we, sure. we you know we have every, yeah. everything's kiln dried and acclimated properly and stuff. Oh, uh, but this is cool. A mahogany, uh, a mahogany top, and look, that bracing looks a little different. It's a little bit uh, less robust in some ways, mm -hmm. but um, it's the lower bout here is all opened up. Mm -hmm. We have one short tone bar instead of two long tone mm -hmm. bars. So you notice this is a much more open area compared to on that D18 that we yeah. saw getting braced earlier. Um, it's got an A-frame here, so it's actually gonna interlock up into the front block as oh. well. Uh, and that's because we want this instrument to sound a little bit different. Um, beautiful. Let me make sure I put it back in the right spot so I don't get in trouble. Perfect. Uh, let's see. Once the sides are bent, uh, we're going to glue the front and rear blocks on to create the rim. And it's a pretty flexible type of situation. Uh, you can see it sort of bounces around and moves around. Uh, but that flexibility is going to be short lived because we are going to very soon take the rim and glue on oh. our ribbon lining, yeah. which is very cool. Um, really cool. Would you like to? Yes, please. <laughs> I'll smell anything <laughs> in here. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the smell of a brand new Martin guitar. When you right. open the case. Unbeatable. Uh, there have been a, a few a few folks have suggested that we should bottle that and sell it oh, as yeah. a, like a a body fragrance in the in the 1833 shop. Yeah. Make sure you get make sure you get credit for that. If that... <laughs> I I may have, it may have been Bollinger who suggested that. I can't remember. <laughs> it was a great idea, a really good idea. Um, and uh, again, uh, extremely uh, technologically advanced clamping mechanisms. Yeah. I mean, uh, it really just is even clothespins, huh? Well, see, here's the thing about guitar making. Yeah. And this is really important for anyone out there who's like interested in making guitars. Uh, if you take a tool and you make it a tool that's specifically for guitar making, even if it does the same thing as the tool that's not specifically for guitar making, it's gonna cost four to five times more because it's a specialized tool. And sometimes you really need the specialized tool, don't get me wrong, but sometimes, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. Um, it's not broke, yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. not just for resealing uh, bags of Cheetos at right, home anymore. Right. Wow. Works good. Um, this is uh, where we laser engrave uh, serial oh, numbers yeah. and our Martin logo. Now, on the, uh, the authentic model that you saw being built in the custom shop, uh, the serial number would actually be hand stamped. Would, they physically would be like oh, pounding each yeah. number individually with a, with a die stamping set and a mallet. But, um, but here you can see how we laser our blocks. And so just line by line, horizontally, right down yep, the road. Yep, pretty much. It's like a printer, you know, yeah. except it's cutting uh, or, you know, um, burning, basically. Like burning, yeah. Um, th this is pretty cool. If you look carefully, you may notice some of those blocks are not like the others. And that may or may not have something to do oh. with a product that okay. may or may not be launching at okay. NAM and may or may not be incorporating alternative wood species. Interesting, okay. Like Little walnuts. Sneak peek. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Looks great. 
Hmm, what's that say? What's the lead time when, when there is a new model coming out? How much lead time does it require in production? Is it months and months? Or? <laughs> yes, that's a great question. And that it ties very closely into, uh, into my job here um, as the, uh, the International Instrument Design Manager. So mostly work on the Mexico side of yeah. instrument design and development, which means we build prototypes here. Oh. Um, you know, I'll build them or sometimes we'll sort of coordinate back and forth oh, and do that cool. a lot yeah. too. Uh, but um, the, the amount of time it takes uh, comes down to a few factors. If we're talking about a simple uh, material swap or a bracing swap on an existing platform of body shape um, that we make, that's pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. right? If you're talking about a new body shape or new configuration of stuff that has never existed before or is not a sort of plug and play type of right. modification, um, it, it, it can take uh, you know a year uh, or longer, um, depending on uh, initial prototyping, which will be done by hand, uh, and then developing some tooling, yeah. all these castings, these fixturing that you see. Yeah. Um, so like uh, the, the bracing um, press, the bracing press doesn't care what guitar is inside mm -hmm. there. So we don't need new bracing presses. Mm -hmm. uh, but the um, but the outer uh, profiles of these like aluminum castings, yeah. which uh, reinforce the guitar against being crushed mm -hmm. when the top and back are being glued on, we would need new ones for those. So our tooling guys would have to make those. So those top are and back. made in house by the tooling guys yeah. as well? Yeah, wow. top and back glue up boards. Um, that would uh, have to be made as well. Um, bracing masks, right? So locate, put the braces in the right locations. Uh, all that stuff adds up um, to time. And each one of those pieces of production necessary uh, hardware needs to be proofed. Uh, quality assurance needs to take measurements as well and approve things. And then we got to actually build some. And like, let's say we build five of something and we look at them with a fine tooth comb and we're like, we want to make a change. Uh, which we do, you know, we're always, we, we never just say, ah, okay, it's good enough, you know, ship it. Um, sure. we, we really do sweat the small stuff. Sure. So yeah. uh, it could take a year or, or even more. I believe it. Hey. So this is the, the step in the process before top and back glue up, okay. where the rim in that casting is uh, having its, its ribbon lining sanded flush. Okay. And it also is gonna apply that drop angle onto the front block mm -hmm. so that you have the correct amount of fall away uh, as you get past the neck joint, Okay. right? You want the fingerboard to sort of like kink downward a little mm -hmm. so you don't have like buzz in your high strings. Yeah. You have to have that little little bit of, sure. uh, we call it fall away. Uh, you know, I'm sure other, um, other manufacturers might have a different term for the same thing. Okay. It doesn't really apply all that much to electric guitars because typically the fingerboard is supported all the way through the whole length of the neck. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, that tongue is like an extension, right? Yeah. So it's sitting on the top. Yeah. So if the top moves up and down, right? Swelling in the summertime or whatever, then uh, you could have problems and you don't have to worry about that on a, on a electric guitar, typically. Sure. Sure. Um, this is a cool uh, process. They're all cool processes. I feel, yeah, like, it, I feel really like every station we go to, I'm like, <laughs> Check this out. I know. And well, it's true. <laughs> well, and and it's really uh, it's really wonderful. The folks who work here, uh, my my friends and colleagues here, they're like some of the best people on the earth at their job, right? And they just they show up and they do it, and uh, it's so much respect for what they do. That it's so amazing. wonderful. Yeah, uh, it's uh, that's definitely uh, a, a wonderful part of our uh, sort of community here. Yeah. Um, dedication uh, precision getting it right um, if you do it if you do it right the getting done part takes care of itself right. but if all you're worried about is getting it done then you might not do it right, right. so um, so we do it right here and you can see uh, what we've done here is we've cut a, a, a ledge um, by a binding ledge uh, onto the outer perimeter of this instrument and this is a very simple one just one piece of plastic um, but uh, not only decorative feature, binding helps protect the outer rims of the guitar. It's the place where uh, you're most likely, again, to have an impact so that that reinforcement that we saw before of the, um, the ribbon lining plus the binding 
just might save you from having a top separation issue if you like oh. you know, it's a lot easier to replace the binding yeah. than it is to steam out a dent on the corner of a top right yeah. um, just in case but it's also the place where a lot of uh, features that Martin guitars are immediately identifiable by have come to live so herringbone on a HB, HD 28 you'd see pearl on a, a 42 style and of course on a 45 it's you know, go all around the sides as well yeah. um, but it's a, uh, a demanding job we have sample reference pieces for every type of binding material that we've probably ever used look at that oh, yeah wow real cool uh, even in even in funky colors blue oh, fiber yeah. and we do um, we do measure every piece of every material that comes in uh, to make sure that it is at spec it's not always right uh, we do cut it um, to the width ourselves. As far as thickness goes, that's the dimension that's going to tell you uh, how deep into the top you want to cut. So to that end, we have an unbelievable selection of uh, collars for the uh, for the spindle head. Uh, so we can watch Mercedes here setting it up right now. She just turned it on. So on the opposite side of her, there is a. Um, there's a protruding spindle, and that is going to set uh, the, the, the depth exactly of the cut. And so she'll do a sample cut. She'll check it against the piece of material to make sure that it is good where, where it needs to be. And then uh, if everything looks good, she'll then cut around the whole perimeter of the guitar. So let's say she has uh, a, bu a bunch of D18s over there, it looks like. So those are all going to get the same dimension cut, right? But then that next cart, that or we call them trucks, but that next truck has a sort of grab bag. I see a triple O, a double O, a single O, a dreadnought, a GPC yeah. down there, OMC. That looks like a, a size two or something crazy. I mean, you know, and every one of them has a different spec. So uh, very. So that's what she's doing here, yeah. Yep. So we do use a variety of materials for binding. Um, the, the sort of most classic uh, D18 style binding would be this tortoise. Um, but we use black material. We use uh, white and cream and antique white material. Uh, we don't use a ton of ivoroid material these days, um, but we do use it, historically have used it. And we use wood um, as well. And in my opinion, man, there's nothing that looks quite as sharp as a wood binding. It is cool. It's just, uh, it's beautiful. The contrast of the different species is just nuts. So uh, the way binding it goes on, um, we, we used to take a rope and like tie it all around the whole thing. Yeah. But these days uh, we use tape to secure stuff. And the uh, thing is, when you pull this tape off, you have to be quite careful because if you're as it now you don't have to worry so much on the on the rosewoods and the mahoganies but on the side where it overlaps onto the spruce mm -hmm. if you pull it off the way that spruce grain is it could just peel out oh. a whole chunk of spruce grain oh wow uh, and then you got a big problem mm -hmm. so um even the little things where you think well how hard can it be to put on or take off a piece of tape believe it or not technique is critical. Um, speaking of technique being critical, here's an area where if you take too much material off, uh, you're going to have a bear of a time getting it back on. And this is oh, for yeah. a very, very important part of the instrument. So uh, this Chad, he's uh, uh, one of the one of the finest neck fitters in the whole land. And what he's doing is a pre-fit. So he is going to, um, what he's done so far is He's glued on a heel cap, and he's done that after cutting the heel of the guitar exactly at the right position so that the layers of the heel cap decoration, see it's like a cream, black, cream, black, cream. Yeah. They're gonna line up perfectly with the lines on the back binding wow. so that they'll be like, it'll look like a seamless, yeah. uh, a seamless decoration. Wow. It's really cool. Wow. And uh, what he's done is removed very very tiny slivers of wood from the the compound dovetail of the neck joint uh, until he's got it fitted and now he's checking to see what it's going to look like when it's all fitted up so this there's no glue involved at this point because the instruments need to be 
sanded a little more, yeah. they need to be finished. Um, they sprayed and finished, polished, all the rest of it. But um, if you don't do this now, then you have a lot more work to do later. Okay. So we can make up for those dimensional changes that are gonna happen shortly. We'll make up for them down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, but this sort of gives us a head start. And obviously you don't wanna finish the neck without having the heel cap on and try to put it on afterwards. Right. So, uh, so it's really important. And uh, I'll show you guys what the inside of a compound dovetail neck joint looks like here in a minute. So um, what you can see here is a compound dovetail uh, on the neck. And the way this works is you have a V-shape like this. Mm -hmm. You also have a V-shape like that on these angles. Okay. And so both of those angles need to be matched to the, uh, to the front block. And you can manipulate how the neck sits in there by taking off a little bit of, you know, and we're talking really small changes mm -hmm results in a really big final changes in geometry. Okay. You know, it's like yeah. if you're if you're like sighting, you know, a really long range yeah. uh, telescope or whatever, and you bump it a little bit, all of a sudden now you're looking 100 yards uh, in the wrong direction when you only moved it a half a millimeter on your end, right? Sure. So same principle applies. So this is sort of the, the premium, uh, premier highest, uh, highest grade of uh, neck joint that we produce. And that's on all standard series instruments. And here you can see a variation of that, which is a simple dovetail. And you can see it still has a dovetail like this, uh, but it doesn't have the compound nature of it, right? So this is still gonna be a great neck joint. It'll secure the neck in there really well, um, but it's a little bit a little bit easier to- uh, And then the truss rod as well. Yeah. yeah, so the truss rod will go in, uh, fretboard will be applied. Obviously it'll already be fretted and then, um, Truss rods, truss rods are a good thing. Um, we don't have them in our authentic guitars uh, because, that, because they're not authentic right. to the 1930s. Right. But if you were looking for an authentic guitar, um, but are concerned about the lack of a truss rod uh, impacting a bit, you know, adjustability and playability later on, which I totally would get that. Um, we make something now called a custom expert model, uh, which is more or less authentic features but with a truss rod. Okay. So um, pretty cool. Uh, you'd have to go online to find out where to, where to get one. But whenever I see those flight flowing through the factory, uh, it makes me really happy. <laughs> so putting the frets in. Oh, yep. So frets go in. Uh, everyone's got, got their own style on this. Now, if you were installing frets all the way with no further like, uh, uh, a intervention, you would want to use like a dead bullet hammer and really like just get them seated all the way. In this case, we don't have to do that um, today. We just need to get them in the right spot, more or less, get them started, and then we'll put them on a hydraulic press that will come down right. and press them all in equally at the same level of pressure uh, and at the same time. Do they get flecked as well or? Yes, oh, yeah, yep, okay. yep, we'll get there. Uh, that's a cool machine. It trims the excess off the fretboards. Oh. so that you're, you don't have sharp fret pokies nice. ready to slice your hand. Oh yeah. Um, so once we get into uh, the world of sanding, um, you're, in a, you're in, a, in a world where you gotta really uh, develop a good eye, uh, a good touch, and you can't blink. Um, you really wanna pay attention. Yeah. Uh, so what we're doing is, um, removing any imperfections uh, from the um, from a tactile standpoint, anything that's like surface imperfections, right? Um, what we're not doing is uh, chasing after every little dark spot because what happens is you go too deep, all of a sudden your side is too thin, you could, someone could buy that guitar and push their thumb right through it. So we won't, we won't sell that. Um, so, uh, you have to you have to know when to chase and when to not chase things because a lot of this stuff you know these instruments here they're already stained it looks like they may be in rework or something but their one is in the in the white so to speak um, there's gl glue residue you want to get rid of that right uh, but if it's like I wonder what's up with that little grain line then, then you'll have problems 
Um, and if you you know if you stand too much too aggressively in one spot, uh, you can you can heat up. You can melt the binding a little bit. That would be very bad. Or more even more critically, if you end up like taking too much off of someplace, the human eye is really very well adapted to picking up parallel lines, oh. right? And that includes the parallel line of your binding around the outer perimeter of your guitar. Mm -hmm. So if your line is even, you'll, you'll be like, oh, that looks good. But if your line is wobbly, yeah. you'll see it immediately. Yeah. And that's unsightly and uh, that would be a disaster. So um, you really want to just kiss it. And we'll start, um, I think we'll start around uh, 180, uh, then go through the grits up to uh, 320. Um, this is cool. This looks wow. like some quilted maple yeah. that's had its uh, had its grain raised up and then stained red. Wow. You do not see a lot of those around. <laughs> that's cool. That's really cool. Oh, this one is uh, pretty interesting wow. as well. Yeah. We happen to have some kind of maple guitar there. Huh. <laughs> What a distinct look, huh? Uh, well, it hasn't received all of its uh, all of its accoutrements yet. Wouldn't that look nice with a like a real cool smoky sunburst on it? Oh yeah. Um, I hear you. <laughs> so so here we have a, a, a pretty important area um, because when you're a guitar player, you're going to interface with the instrument primarily through the neck, yeah. right? Right. I mean, you might touch the strings or or you might use a pick. But really, the neck is where all the all the business is happening as far as you uh, being comfortable with the guitar uh, from a from a playing uh, standpoint. So we strive to make sure that all of our necks from a spec standpoint are consistent to how they physically will feel on the final product, regardless of what that spec is. So uh, if you fall in love with a modified low oval neck shape, but you don't have the money to buy it today, you come back in six months and there's another guitar that has a modified low oval neck shape, we want to be 100% confident. When you pick that up, you're gonna be like, yeah, That's I remember it. this, I love this, right? Um, or if it's a vintage shape, whatever that, that may be. But and to make the point though, is it true that basically after the rough shaping of the neck, they do, they're, they're making that by hand though. Yes. They're, they're, and so everyone is shaped by hand. Yep, yeah, yep. Wow. And the way we achieve the consistency is with the variety of gauges that you see oh, on yeah. the, so we have, uh, we have a gauge that shows uh, the first fret profile, tenth fret profile, the heel swoop profile, thickness gauge for uh, first fret, tenth fret, and that's a go slash no go gauge. Mm -hmm. So it'll fit over up to a point, but if it's not, if it's too big, uh, it'll uh, it'll bump and it won't let you actually yeah. pass the gauge through. Uh, and all that um, is, you know, it's not just like quality control gotchas, you know, like oh let's see, no, it's all about making sure that that neck feels the same. Yeah. If it's a modified V neck, it's a modified V, it's a modified V, it's a modified V, a full thickness is a full thickness, you know, and yeah. and um, and, it, and it gives uh, it gives our operators here who are highly skilled, yeah. it gives them a frame of reference. Uh, the, I think probably one of the harder jobs, and I, I, I can tell you I personally have screwed up like a dozen of them over the years, is getting those diamonds the diamond volute and the ear carved just right at the at the neck. I was, um, I was watching them do the volute. Yeah. You know, and, and that's a traditional feature on our 28 style guitars. Yeah. Uh, it comes from way back in the day, they would have had a scarf joint. Mm -hmm. So it would have been two pieces oh. and scarfed together. Now we hog it out of one piece, um, but we kept the diamond because it, you know, it does strengthen it and it looks really sharp and good. Yeah. But, um, you know, it takes a while to develop those hand skills. So when you see something like that, that's perfection, man. Nothing, re nothing but respect from my man Jeremy over there. Yeah. Rock and roll. Thank you. So filler, it's not the most glamorous job in the world, but I'll tell you, it results in a great finish and there's no substitute for it. So woods like rosewood and mahogany, they have open pores. Mm -hmm. That means that uh, if you were to just not seal and fill uh, them, if you stain them, you'd still have open pores and you go to spray it and the lacquer just sinks into the Soaks pores. In. And guess what? We like that look. We do use that look. We, you know, at a certain price point, it's great. It's still going to protect the wood um, and it's going to look nice, you know, on a, a Dreadnought Junior, for example, right? Yeah. It uses a open pore finish, but it still has lacquer on okay. it. Well, if you want a mirror finish, like glassine, you know, see your own reflection in there, 
you need to fill those pores very precisely. Oh. And so we apply it in a big slurry, oh. you know, all the big, big goop, yeah. then we squeegee it off. And of course there's been sanding that has occurred that has put microscopic scratches in the plastic. So the plastic will, will darken as the, as the filler dries in it. And then we'll take a really sharp blade. This wow. one is not sharpened because you know, yeah, right. you never know who's coming on tour. Right, right. <laughs> we'll take a really sharp blade and, and physically scrape that back. So wow. if we, uh, if we'll, we can just take a moment and watch here. Oh, wow. That does not look easy at all. It's tough because if you overshoot and yeah. you catch the wood, yeah, you, it won't look it right. And if you, so easy to do that. If you don't go far enough, it doesn't look right. If you stop while you're scraping, the blade will catch and then you'll have a little thing and it'll be impossible. You know, you'll be like trying to go over it and over it to try to get it. And, and it just is really hard. Yeah. So cool, cool job. Very cool. Steady hand, steady eye. Uh, yeah. Uh, very hypnotic. Looks like we are, uh, we're learning how to do stuff oh, today. Cool. That's cool. So many of the folks here in the factory are um, what we call cross trained, you know, so they they have a job, they know um, how to do is their, their primary job, but um, there's a lot of opportunity to uh, move around depending on where, um, you know, where production support is yeah. needed. Um, there's, uh, you know, often there are overtime uh, opportunities as well mm -hmm. and stuff like that. This is, this is a sort of magical space. Uh, this is our whip repair area. And what we're doing is um, we're inspecting things after they've been finished. We are correcting, inspecting, and perfecting, you know. Uh, yeah. And you guys should take that, put it on your next uh, department t-shirt. Yeah. That was pretty good. Um, what, what we're doing is uh, anything that doesn't quite look right, um, we have an opportunity to fix it and make it like it never happened, okay. right? And uh, we don't sell factory seconds. If anyone ever says, oh, I bought a Martin factory second, it doesn't exist. Um, you know, occasionally yeah, yeah. a pro prototype will escape the building in a, in a proto sale or whatever. Yeah. Um, but if it's being sold at retail and it's a Martin guitar, it's, you know, tip top. That's it. It's got to be. So uh, to that end, this is where some of that magic happens. And uh, usually um, by the time these guys are done fixing something, even the most eagle eyed uh, mm -hmm. inspector wouldn't be able to see uh, what it was that they were fixing. Mostly finish, you know, you get a little. There are so many words for things that can happen in the finish of a, of a guitar yeah. or really any kind of woodwork, right? Yeah. You have uh, something called fish eye which is where you got like a, like a oh. it looks like a fish eye. Yeah. You got orange peel, which looks like orange peel. Yeah. You got um, overspray, you know, type things that don't look good. You got, um, what else? We've got uh, shiners that don't look good. Uh, you can have spatter of, uh, of color that, that, that doesn't look good. And all of that stuff uh, is part and parcel. You know, um, you can have little flakes of things, little noogies that get stuck in there, and yeah. then you gotta either sand them out, pick them out, or dig them out, but you don't wanna go too deep because then you'll hit your stain, and then right. you gotta. So, um, all of which to say, uh, finish and finish sanding, uh, finish inspection, this is really critical. That was, this is my first job here at Martin oh, Guitar, wow. it was back in that booth, Rydell. And um, we, we sand finishes in a, multi-stage process. So um, the first five coats of lacquer go on, everything gets inspected and sanded back and inspected again. And then they'll get another five coats or four coats of lacquer. And uh, okay, it looks like three for a spot touch up. And then uh, once that final um, amount of, of lacquer is on the instrument, uh, it'll be um, sanded back again, inspected again, and then ready for polish. Okay, this is absolutely wild and diabolical. I want to show you guys something cool. I'm gonna take off my my uh, watch so I don't put a dent in anything. But this instrument here has just been released. So we are very passionate about uh, anniversary models here at Martin Guitar, right? 
We have a lot of history to celebrate, something Chris is passionate about too. And what we have here looks like a really beautiful mahogany top. It's not, that's Adirondack spruce. Oh wow. With a mahogany pattern uh, print on it. And you can see that it's spruce. Oh wow. But it is so unbelievably lifelike. So Tim, uh, or um, uh, my, my colleague Tim Teal uh, came up with a really great way to apply these sorts of finishes, microscopically thin, like laser sprayed basically, right? And uh, uh, Chris Martin uh, recalled that there was a model called a D19 back in the day. And uh, it had a spruce top that was stained very dark. And it kind of didn't look so good. But keeping that theme alive, to do a spruce top and present it in a dark, um, you know, sort of dark color, well, you could get there by uh, applying a print of a different species over top of the spruce. Okay. Yeah. So it'll sound like spruce, but look like mahogany. Okay. It's kind of like a mind bender, yeah, right? right? We have a, a, a pretty active repair department here at Martin. Um, these are people's, you know, privately held instruments that they send in. Uh, sometimes we'll see stuff from like the 1830s that is still out on the road getting played oh, by musicians. Yeah. And they are like, oh, back to the mothership, yeah. um, which is very cool. Uh, I'd like to let you guys watch this process one time wow. because it is incredible. So uh, what we have here is our polishing bot. And I wonder if we're gonna get to watch it do its thing. Um, but basically uh, it's a robot that does the first step of a buffing, uh, a buffing treatment oh. on a guitar uh, body. Now we still have to go through and buff it several more times with different mm -hmm. grits um, in order to get it up to the, uh, oh, there it goes. get it up to the right gloss level. But this first cut the initial buffing here. is very, very cool. So it's just got those suction cups that yep. pull the body, huh? Yeah, you really gotta have a lot of trust in those suction cups, don't yeah. you? That is wild. Whoa. <laughs> so we have a, a, a wheel, a cotton wheel, that is impregnated with uh, a, a abrasive wax compound. Okay. And that wax compound is actually being fed. Hey, thanks, Adam. It's actually being fed by uh, that bar of soap looking stuff up there. Oh, that's it's getting moving pushed up out and down. Into it. Yeah. yeah. So that's wax. And um, the robot. This is wild. Saves us a lot of uh, a lot of heartache during that first aggressive cut. I believe it. I, I think the robot's showing off. Did you see that little <laughs> yeah. flourish there? I did notice that. Though. I don't think I ever saw that before. They may have they may have programmed in a little yeah, they have uh, a tour program, right? A little <laughs> flare just for you guys. I like it. I like it. That is, yeah, because again, I mean, if, if somebody's doing this by hand in the initial stages, you push too hard, you know, it's if it, uneven well, spots or... The, the, yeah, that's part of it, but there there are a few other concerns. If you push too hard or wet linger too long, mm -hmm. it'll actually take the finish off. You'll burn through it, then you got to refin the whole thing, mm -hmm. and you got the added problem that now you got little wax particles all over it, so the finish won't adhere. you got to strip it. Well, oh. the other big thing, and uh, you have not truly lived until you've heard one of these things happen. Um, but uh, I've been making guitars for a long time here at Martin uh, and in a, a prior life before work, you know, working in guitars. And I've dropped three instruments, I think, on buffing wheels over the course of like oh, 20 years. Yeah. And what happens is if you catch it a sharp edge, yeah. it's inevitable. If you buff, you know, hundreds or thousands of guitars, you're going to drop one, right? Yeah. If you catch a sharp edge on that wheel, which is spinning pretty fast, It'll take the whole thing right out of your hands, put it straight on the ground. At that speed. Bang. Yeah. Boom. It yeah. sounds oh. like a, you know, it sounds like a, like a blast, you know, it's crazy. Um, so when that happens, uh, which does happen from time to time, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want to make fun of the person too much because it's only a matter of time until it happens to you. Happen you know to you. what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. So, um, oh, man. uh, not definitely not a daily or weekly occurrence, but Are it they does. Are still gonna laugh at you when it, it happens? It does happen. So? I usually just a slow clap, <laughs> you know. Yeah, a little clap. Yeah. Um, we uh, we do we have talked a little bit about our our factory in uh, Navajo, Mexico. Yeah. Um, the folks that work there are incredible uh, guitar makers, 
and they uh, they've been making um, making Martins for 35 years. So long history. Yeah. It's funny to think that our our sister partner facility in Mexico uh, has been around longer than some of the competitive brands uh, that, were, sure. <laughs> that are out on the sure, market yeah. today. Um, but they do a great job, um, you know, and it's a great way for us to put our brand into the hands of players who can't afford a Nazareth instrument. Yeah. But in their earlier development, you know, as a guitar player, if they're a beginner, or if there's someone who's stepping up to a Martin, you know, they take their craft more seriously, um, or more of an investment in, in their musicianship, um, that they can trust that they're getting a really good quality guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna sound good, it's gonna be made well, it's gonna have a warranty. Yeah. It's going to be built according to the same quality specifications that we use in Nazareth. Mm -hmm. As far as inspections and everything else, same standard supply. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of what is the appointment level, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll see more satin finishes down there, uh, more ukuleles. Mm -hmm. um, we do make ukuleles here in Nazareth, but they're very, very expensive. And the market is, you know, is flooded with, you know, souvenir ukes that are not real instruments. Right, right. So we wanted to make sure we continue providing ukuleles out there at an affordable price mm -hmm. that are still heirloom grade instruments. Mm -hmm. And it's also a place for us to, um, showcase and experiment with alternative materials. Mm -hmm. So here, this is a totally synthetic high pressure oh, yeah. laminate back yeah. and sides on this instrument. It has a solid spruce top. It has a hand sprayed sunburst. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the bracing is solid, sick of spruce. The thing sounds fabulous, mm -hmm. but no mm -hmm. trees required. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, this is a, a, a pulp paper manufacturing byproduct, mm -hmm. this stuff is. so. Um, to be able to repurpose that wow. and use it to make guitars that are very, very durable. They're more or less insensitive to temperature and humidity, you know, concerns in mm -hmm. normal environment. Mm -hmm. um, they don't crack, mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. And a laminated birch plywood neck, mm -hmm. right? So you have like 40 or 30 so birch plies. they're all pressed this way and then shaped, yeah. They're all pressed like this. And then that lends itself to a very, very stable neck. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're a person who wants to buy a guitar, have a good instrument um, and not have to worry about maintaining perfect humidity in your home, which you should, you know, you should try to do that. Um, but, you know, maybe These it's are a lot more forgiving, huh? Concerned. Yeah. If you're going to be traveling, you're not going to be able to find a luthier to adjust your truss rod. Mm -hmm. Well, something like this, it's a little bit denser and heavier. It doesn't sound quite as good as a D28, mm -hmm. but it's going to serve the purpose really well for that person. Mm -hmm. And, and it's at its price point of whatever, six ninety nine seven hundred dollars mm -hmm. We're confident that our offering is going to be a contender mm -hmm. to be the best one in that price category, wherever you go. So if you got a certain amount, you're, you're, you have dollar X mm -hmm. or, or peso or Euro X mm -hmm. to spend on a guitar. Mm -hmm. Right. And you go to the store and there's like, a wall full of options in that price point. Mm -hmm. What we strive for and will make me really happy uh, to, to continue to try to achieve this mm -hmm. as an instrument designer is when you reach for the Martin guitar, it should hold its own against any other instrument at that price category. And you should be left thinking, you know, that one sounds pretty darn good. Yep. You know, um, cool. whether it's an entry level guitar or a professional grade mm -hmm. instrument. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we care a lot about that. Uh, let's take a look at the final assembly process. Awesome. So uh, you guys probably can tell, oh, look at this. This is the mitten of encouragement. <laughs> it's giving uh, giving everyone a thumbs up like as they that. go down the tour aisle. <laughs> That's new. I've never seen that before. <laughs> One, uh, so the lacquer is nitro? Yes, and yes. when it's made in Mexico, is it a poly or is it a, a, a nitro just with a satin so, finish? So, uh, good question. So, it depends. Um, some models will use a um, a 30 sheen catalyzed uh, nitrocellulose lacquer. Mm -hmm. um, some of them will use a UV cure uh, poly. Okay. Um, and uh, so, the, the satin models mm -hmm. are largely uh, still a nitro. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the new D15. E, um, which is a which is a pretty new release, all the juniors and stuff. Those are using a a uh, you know catalyzed uh, satin mm -hmm. um, nitro, mm -hmm. but the the really shiny ones typically are UV. Although in some cases we have used the 90 sheen um, 
Okay. So yeah, just just curious. Yeah. Oh, look good, at that. That's a good question. Oh yeah. So whenever you know we have like tour, I don't give a ton of tours these days. Honestly, it's mostly for. This is, this is fantastic. Well, it's it, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's because so we you know I just I can't stop talking about everything. But uh, yeah. we we uh, we like to have guests uh, like use their imagination and guess what the shiny. Um, it's funny too because we call it pearl. Like, mm -hmm. what do you think this shiny pearl is made out of? And the kids will always be like, metal, yeah. or like gold. I'm like, right. no, I told you it's pearl. And they're like, it's made from pearls. <laughs> like, well, it's made from seashells. Yeah. Um, and this is an abalone, like a conch abalone shell. It's had all of its nacreous, uh, you know, calcified stuff sanded off of there. And what you're left with is like, this incredible, I mean, it looks like the grain of wood almost, right? I've actually it's never seen incremental that. That's, growth. That's really cool to see. Wild. So beautiful. This looks like a, some sort of power abalone. Mm. Um, now, these are uh, a food delicacy. They're eaten mm. in, uh, in parts, of, uh, parts of Southeast Asia, I believe, um, and uh, Oceania. I've never had one. Um, maybe they're good. They're probably, they must be good, right? Mm. People eat them. Uh, uh, but Pearl comes in a, in a variety of flavors. So we have mother pearl, we have abalone, uh, powa. We have um, different colors that naturally occur and then are sorted uh, at the, the vendors where we purchase the pearl from. Mm -hmm. We don't buy like shells like right, this. Right. Um, but we do use um, a, a pearl and other natural materials like uh, stone, sometimes reconstituted stone, um, to add the perimeter embellishments um, around guitars, or that's the rosette, um, or the binding, um, the inlay. And uh, one of the ways that we, you know, from a production, tricky production standpoint, uh, that we achieve this is when we bind it, we'll bind it with a, like a Teflon sort of po poly filler strip oh, in okay. there. And then everything dries, it all gets sanded up, it's all like good to go. And then you pull this strip out mm -hmm. and you're left with like a perfect gap. Oh. And that's where we can then install these pieces or crack them into place. Um, but here you can you can kind of see the difference between a white mother of pearl, which is that center fleur de -lis type piece, and the, these outer ones, and then the, the green um, abalone there. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's some power too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Unbelievable. very traditional, yeah. very, very beautiful. And there's something about shiny things Wild. that has attracted human yeah. interest for something a long, long it. time. So, We've got glue in our channel. We're putting in a sort of slightly pre. So it has a little bit of flex to it, or no, it has to be. No, you hear that cracking? Yeah. That's, that's... the sound of it popping wow. into place. It will physically snap a little bit. Wow. There we go. Nice. Thanks, Joel. Thank you. You ever see a, a you know Discovery show or whatever uh, show uh, how it's made? Yeah. Um, working here is almost like you know it, like it really satisfies that ASMR right, you know right. of, totally of, of like manufacturing sounds and and uh, sights and movements. So what we have mm -hmm. here is uh, this is a automated uh, machine that is going to measure the thickness of the lacquer and the exact position of um, the, a variety of characteristics. So what, it, what we have is a ruby tip sensor. It's measuring the oh, yeah. exact outer profile of that fingerboard because mm -hmm. they're hand sanded, so it runs a little bit different, and the dovetail dimensions on this simple dovetail mm -hmm. neck. And what it's going to do is it's going to transfer those measurements to uh, a cut that will match that outer profile of the fingerboard and the heel of the guitar exactly to the same location it needs, needs to be on the body. Mm -hmm. So that way we are gluing wood to wood. We remove the lacquer and the lacquer is removed so accurately that there's no, you know, there's no exposed wood. It looks like a seamless wow. like transition. So wow. some manufacturers, um, as part of their process, they spray bodies and necks once they've already been glued together, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a, a certain look, you know, it's, it's cool, uh, cool, right? Mm -hmm. What we do is a little different. We, uh, we actually finish bodies and necks separately and join them together at the end with extreme precision um, so that, you know, you have a really clean looking, 
clean looking line. There's no nooks and crannies for like paint to get gunked yeah, up into sure. or anything like that. And it makes them removable, you know, in the future if there's a, you know, some sort of service requirement. So here we're taking uh, dimensional measurements of the top and it re-zeroes itself. And it's gonna take probably measure. Oh, here comes the cutter. And you can actually see what's happening. This is so, this is so fantastic, thank you. Isn't that wild? Um, you know, we still do this by hand, you know, on some stuff we'll scribe and scrape it with, a, with an X-Acto knife yeah. uh, and get a chisel in there and actually remove the material. But honestly, there's a lot of things that we don't need to prove anymore that we like know how to do, sure. you know. Yeah. Um, but to that, to that point, keeping the skill set alive is critical because, you know, imagine, you know, in production, um, you're sort of tooled up, you're staffed to produce a certain number of instruments mm -hmm. per day. There's some orders, you know, you gotta, you want people to be satisfied that they're, you know, the order of guitar is gonna come in a timely fashion. Right. Well, what if one of these machines has a catastrophic failure, mm -hmm. right? Um, it hasn't happened, you know, knock, touch wood, hasn't happened for a while. So you need to have people who know how to who do things by hand. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I'd like to think if, if ever we had to make guitars and the power was out, uh, I think there'd be a good couple dozen, couple dozen folks still ready to ready to show up and do it, and I love that. I we think saw that's the old really North Factory cool. where really they have the big windows because they that was the light you had, right? Yep, I mean, pretty much. <laughs> um, uh, the same principle that we use to cut the uh, the opening for um, a good fingerboard to top glue up and the heel glue up, we're going to use that uh, same um, concept to glue the bridges on these instruments. What we do is we actually cut a pocket that will exactly match the outer profile of whatever bridge an instrument is supposed to get at the exact location too, so that helps a lot. Um, the location being dependent on the saddle location inside the bridge um, program. And uh, the reason is we're gluing wood directly onto wood mm -hmm. because the bond is only as strong as the things that you're bonding together. Mm -hmm. If you have a good properly fitted uh, glue joint between two pieces of wood using the right amount of glue and the right type of glue, it's stronger than the wood. Mm -hmm. It's really strong. Mm -hmm. But if you glue it to, to paint, mm -hmm. then your glue joint is only gonna be as strong, or rather your joint itself, it doesn't matter what kind of glue you're using, it's only gonna be as strong as the bond between the paint and the wood, okay. which is not okay. that yeah. strong, right. you know? Um, so wood to wood, uh, and once those bridges are glued on, guitars come to their magical debut as a fine stringed instrument. Oh, there it is. Getting now, up. a few lucky guitars. Greg, may I may I put you on the uh, ahead, put you on blast here? <laughs> this is this is my man Greg here. He um, uh, works here in, in final assembly and stringing, and he also is the person. Primarily, if you are a professional celebrity guitar player, someone who is you know doing it for a living, um, and uh, maybe has a, a couple few record contracts under your belt. Yeah. Uh, he is the person to whom your request ultimately would get forwarded. Wow. And so um, he prepares uh, not just, uh, you know, production guitars, but also instruments that are getting ready to go to trade shows, mm -hmm. um, instruments that are getting ready for uh, very special purposes, mm -hmm. you know, again, special requests from artists uh, and luminaries. And uh, when I have been uh, occasionally throughout the years shopping for Martin guitars, as one does uh, with our generous employee discount. <laughs> right. um, nice. uh, you know, if I, uh, if I had an opportunity to, to get Greg's input on an instrument before I would finalize the purchase, you know, he's, he'd be, he'd the, be guy. the guy to ask, yeah. you know. And, and, you know, I'd be the first to tell you, you know, you go and say, hey, is it a good one? They're all good ones. You know, there's, there's, there's not, a lot, not a lot of dogs come across right. the bench. No. But um, but sometimes you you know you find something that really is going to be special uh, if you, if you're looking for a very specific mm -hmm. set of characteristics. So um, these instruments, uh, it's the first time they're being strung up. Mm -hmm. If something's going to let go under tension, this is the place where it would be most likely to happen, right? Um, that first time they're getting strings laced up on them. First time they're the, all the joints are being tested. Uh, so we're watching for any kind of movement that's unnatural, mm -hmm. any kind of movement in the neck that's unnatural, uh, any kind of creaking, crunching sounds like yeah. in the movie Das Boat when the <laughs> submarine goes too deep and yeah. you can, yeah, um, 
I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but actually, though, it is kind of like that, yeah. right? So you're putting them under pressure for the very first time. And uh, we check the electronics. We obviously have installed electronics at this stage. We're checking them, making sure they function. And then uh, every guitar will get played. Yeah. So everyone that you see working in this department is a, is a good guitar player. Some of them are fabulous guitar players. They're all competent. Um, and uh, that moment when you first hear the voice of a brand new guitar, that's, that's there is nothing quite like it. Um, because, uh, you know, it's also nice to remember this is the worst that they are ever going to sound. From this day forward, they pretty much just, just get better. And so we know if our baseline, if you're starting out, we're like, whoa, you know, sky's the limit um, once these instruments get broken in and appreciated and, uh, and played in. Um, so we will play them. We'll play every single note, every single fret, um, check for any kind of fret buzz, rattle, anything like that. Um, we didn't really talk about it, but after the bridge close, gets glued on, the instruments do get plucked. Yeah. Um, so we have our flex station over here, which we'll, we'll do a drive by of that real quick. Um, but this is where the rubber meets the road. And once these instruments have been strung up and set up and played to the satisfaction of our discerning operators here, yeah. you think we just throw them in a case and ship them? No, we put them back in the case we hang, we, and we stick them on a shelf for four more days. Oh, okay. And just we, to see just what to hold them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And that way, if there's any kind of movement, any kind of tweak that needs to happen for a truss rod or an action setting, or if it looks like something is moving more than it should, you know, for example, in, a, in terms of the top belly or the bridge, yeah. then we have an opportunity to reinspect. Mm -hmm. So every instrument gets held for days, then it gets reinspected, and only then will it be um, sent to its final destination. Wow. So this, so this is truly the first time this guitar is, is making a sound. Never been heard before. That is so cool. You're the first people to ever hear that guitar. That is really cool. I know, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty wild. It's, so when it sits for four days, also it has a string tension on it now. And yep. it's like a couple hundred pounds or it's pounds? Uh, it's about 190 pounds, wow. the medium set, yeah. A light set might be closer to like 180, mm -hmm. you know. 12 strings, you're looking at like 270, yeah. you know, a lot more. <laughs> a lot more. Yeah. Um, basses and uh, basses, much less, less tension. Sure, yeah. um, and we do make uh, we make a variety of basses these days. We make a, a junior bass cool. with and without a cutaway. You played it, it's fun. Yeah, you like that? Cool, yeah. yeah, those uh, our R&D guys came to us one day. They're like, hey, uh, <laughs> what do you think? We were like, are you kidding me? Great idea. So we, yeah, we fleshed cool. that out and uh, it turned out really good. Actually, uh, they developed uh, a special string to go with it. So it has a nylon core. Oh, there it is. Brought to life. <laughs> Can you tell us where that's going, Greg? Can you tell us where that's going, or is that top secret? This is a special. That's all this is. This is a, like a Gruen guitar. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. Oh, so that's, that's going to Nashville. <laughs> Did you hear that? It's going to Gruen. This one here is going to go to Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend to sign. Oh, wow. oh my gosh. You said wow. to sign, not to, to smash, to right? To sign. Okay, not good. Not to smash. Yeah. Hey, not when, not when the who is involved, you, so you can't much. be too careful. Right. Thanks, Greg, man. Well, guys. That's that pretty awesome. much the sum of it, so you know, cool. from from raw material to uh, to strong and uh, strong and sounding good. Um, this is a big factory. Oh, this so, is about one third of our machining um, area down yeah. here. So there's more. And then we have wood acclimating as well, which yeah. is like Mongo Mongo. And then we have a couple other um, facilities where we store more wood yeah. off site. And how um, many guitars roughly a day come through here? 200. 200 guitars Just about. a day. Just yeah. about. Yeah. Wow. Unbelievable. Look, give or take five or ten, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we won't put it put that in there. Yeah. Or I mean, thank you so much what for bringing pleasure. us on this incredible tour. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. And Martin Guitars brought to life before your eyes. Remember, when you're in the market for a Martin guitar, click to buy using our link. You do help us out when you do that. You get easy payment plans, fast free shipping. And there's gonna be a lot of happy players that end up with these beautiful Martins that we saw today. Thank you so much for doing it's this. It's my pleasure. Now, we're doing all the talking, but it's these guys behind the cameras. They've been walking and 
focusing and you know so <laughs> that's right big ups to you guys too thank you so much for absolutely joining us thank today, you so man. much absolutely and you can check out also our videos on the martin museum which is incredible we even got some footage of the old north street factory this has been an incredible trip so thank you to everybody at martin thank you again and check out our next video on playing trade guitars thanks for being here with us today take care rock and roll Awesome. Thanks again, dude. Hey, wow. That was really fun. That was so awesome. Thank you so much. Well, you know, that Thank was you like for arranging shockingly, yeah, we, so we actually like, we banged through it pretty yeah. good. Oh yeah. That was good. You guys are an efficient squad. Yeah, seriously. Thank you so much. Holding it down. Like, like, holding it down like with I'm the, the nose. The light <laughs> man. Yeah, I am the light yeah. man. <laughs> I looked away every second I can to see it with my own eyes. Now, I, don't, I don't know if this is an intentional color coordination, so but the camera blends perfectly into yeah, your right. shirt. <laughs>